whether you're taking a jog or working out or studying or even taking a shower, you're probably most likely listening to music. In fact, in a sur large-scale survey conducted by the ISIP across 21 different countries in the year 2019, it was estimated that the average person spent close to 19 hours listening, listening to music every week. That's a lot. Music is, and always has been, part of our everyday lives. From the dawn of time, ancient civilizations of humans have sung songs and musical, and the earliest musical instruments date back to almost 35,000 years ago. And with technologies improving, it's a common sight nowadays to see someone walking down the street with earpods on, with listening to music. So what about music makes it so special? And why are we so attracted to it? To answer these questions, we must first delve into the science of music. We have to um, define what music is. It seems pretty clear at first, but it does get a bit muddy. I mean, I can't just scream and call that music. That's just noise. Music is a specific type of sound that it's elegant yet complex. And at the core of it, music and any type of sound really is just a string of sound waves. When a person talks, their vocal cords rapidly vibrate to produce air molecules and push them apart. And so you've probably noticed from experience that if you put your finger on your throat while talking, you can actually feel your throat vibrating when you talk. And you can feel that through the skin of your fingers. And so, and talking isn't even the only way to produce sound. As you all know, there are other examples, such as the vibrating string of a violin, the air coming out of a flute, or even the vibrating air inside an opera singer's throat. And when these rapid vibrations occur, they create high areas of pressure and low areas of pressure inside the air. And these, if these areas hit your ear, when they hit your ear, it causes your earbud, which is a very small, light, flexible membrane inside your ear, to vibrate, and which in turn tells your brain what type of sound you just heard. And when these areas of high pressure and these areas of low pressure are very close together in a frequent manner, then that's what we call a high frequency or a high pitch sound. And vice versa, if these areas of high pressure and low pressure are very far apart, then we call that a low pitch sound or a low frequency sound. This is a diagram of that happening. And if you have these low frequency or high frequency sounds, whether you're in a um, whether you're in a concert or drinking um, water, it can alter these things. For example, if you're if you inhale helium balloon, then when you inhale the helium inside the balloon, you may probably know that it causes your voice to increase by a significant amount. And that occurs because when you inhale the helium inside the helium balloon, the vo air in your throat changes to the helium from the balloon you just inhaled, which creates a special effect that it, the sound waves in your throat are going through a different medium, a less dense medium, and in turn it creates a special effect of your voice becoming a higher pitch. Another example is when you're at a loud concert and you're right next to large speakers, you can literally feel the ground pulsing beneath you and feel the music vibrating inside your body. And while that is an extreme example, it's exactly how your ear works. It's just that your ear is a lot more sensitive. So now that we've defined what sound is, how can we distinct between music and noise? One option we can go toward is math. Mathematics gives a surprisingly well-defined distinction between these two things, where it defines music as ordered sound and noise as disordered sound. And by doing this, we can come to an easy conclusion. For example, 
the simplest form of sound is one single note, one frequency, one pitch. And if you have one pitch, that is what you call a pure note. And a pure note, in terms of math, is basically the fundamental building block of music. And so by that logistic, we can define music as a combination of these pure notes. And we can go even further than that because we can divide these combinations into two different parts, monotonic music and polytonic music. Monotonic music, where mono means one, is defined as a combination of pure tones where it is just simply pure and pure tones alone. And actually, it sounds very dull if you hear something like it. An example of it is if you can imagine like a ringtone from a watch in like the 1980s, then it's probably, a lot of people would probably not consider that music. I know I certainly wouldn't. So then that leads us to the conclusion that what, what is music would be considered polytonic music. And the dictionary defines this as a combination of pure tones in such a manner that sounds harmonious, which is helpful, but it still leaves us the question, what makes a combination of notes harmonious and musical? And to do that, we can't keep going with math. We've talked about the mathematical analysis, and we could go all along, all day. But the reality is, we haven't even scratched the surface of math. There is Fourier analysis, linear superp superposition, additive synthesis. There's a lot more we could do with the mathematics of sound that we haven't gone into yet. But the reality is that music is what feels pleasant to us. Music makes us feel. And that ability to alter human emotion is what makes music, music. An example of this is we talked about the music, mathematics of music just now, but I could disprove that. For example, if you have an example of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, it's a tune that probably all of you know. So I just want you to hum it in your head, and then what if I told you to hum it again, but in a louder fashion. You would be like, okay, that's a bit loud, but all right. But then what if I told you to do it again, but even louder? And if I kept doing this at one point, would it not be indifferentiable from just a loud blare of noise? That, I feel like that is a great point because that shows that music is more than just a set of predictable, defined set of numbers. And that is a relief to me because by saying music isn't something like that, that in turn says that human emotion is deeper than that. Now, another example is sad music makes us sad. Happy music makes us happy. That's just how it works. And so in a simpler terms, that just says that music is a universal language. It doesn't matter if the person you're talking to is French or Korean or English. It, like if whatever language they speak, they don't need to understand your culture or your language to understand if a music is sad or happy. They will know it. It means that's a universal language. And to further prove this point, I will give you an example. In 1977, NASA launched the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 into space. It was the first interstellar man-made aircraft launched outside of our solar system. And actually, several years ago, in 2012, it just escaped our solar system. And in that billions of millions of dollars of project where many different countries participated, one of its purposes of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 was to hopefully get in contact with any existing alien species if there were existing, and to tell them of our location and to hopefully communicate with us in the future. And out of all the money they could spend on it, what did they spend on? They spent it on a golden record, which is basically a disc, a very small disc. And out of all the things they could put on it, they put pictures too, but a large chunk of it was dedicated to music. They put 90 minutes of music in it, which shows how universal the language of music is. 
And when these sounds of harmonious music hit you, you can have different reactions in your system, biologically speaking, in, in a more scientific sense. Um, these sound waves have a trigger mechanism in your body, and what's called your parasympathetic nervous system, or the rest and digest system, gets triggered, and it releases dopamine in your brain, among other chemicals, and that's why sometimes listening to music might relieve you of stress or alter your mood. And this form can also take in the form of pilar erection, which is kind of like Spider-Man's spidey tingles when he like senses danger. And that when the hair stands up, some people get that when they listen to music. And while the variety, the magnitude and the frequency of these erections or reactions might differ among people, the fact is that every single human subconsciously or consciously has and help people with their changing moods. Another, another example of music being used is in movies. Like, have you ever heard a movie without the sound or music in it? It's very boring. It, I don't think anyone would survive a whole movie without the music. And so, these movie, movie music composers use these music and melodies to emphasize the motifs and moods and tones going on in the movies to underline and help bring forth the human emotions in a human. And in conclusion, what are your listening to music and jamming to music before a sport activity or just listening to melancholy music before like just being sad and taking a nap? Or what are you listening to pop music, rap music, or classical music? We all listen to music because fundamentally it gives us time that our busy modern lives don't, don't give us time for. It's the time, it's to give us the time to finally feel something. And so I urge you, the next time you listen to something, music or any song, take the time, take a step back, and really try and think about how something so concrete and little, like sound waves, provoke such abstract and meaningful human emotions inside of you. Thank you.